Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us from across the globe, you are very welcome to this session organized by the Education Collaborative. It is a session on AI and chat GPT, and we are considering the considerations for higher education institutions. Welcome, please feel free on joining to register your details in the chat box. Would like to know your name, your institution, and the country where you're joining us from. AI and ChatGPT considerations for higher education institutions. As we all know, access to technology and the internet in Africa, though the lowest in the world is steadily growing, it raises the question how we as stakeholders in higher education in sub-Saharan Africa are getting ahead to set the foundations for not just agility in, techn in technological competence of the youth we educate, but also integrity and ethics in its use and manipulation. Chat GPT has brought to our doorsteps and made real artificial intelligence in our daily lives. For some of us, it is scary and confusing. And yet for some, it is exciting and daring. Today, we are going to collectively explore this new technology and share some strategies on teaching and learning in a generative, artificially intelligent world. I'll be using the term AI instead of artificial intelligence. That's what I'll mean. So including policies institutions can put in place. Let us reflect as we go along. What about you as higher education stakeholders in Sub-Saharan Africa? What have you considered for your lecture room and university around AI use? What have you put in place? What are your concerns and hopes? What ideas are you grappling with? Today, I would like to invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to join us with panelists, Dr. Giju Paul, the academic registrar at Isbat University, and Mr. Oscar Correa, as they chat on how institutions, stakeholders, faculty, staff, and executive leadership in higher education institutions is grappling with the advancement of AI in the classroom and in academic work. I am Dr. Olive Sabiti. I am the Deputy Vice Chancellor at Cavendish University, Uganda. And I'm going to allow to give the other panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves to the audience. My day-to-day -day activity is focused on ensuring that students are prepared for the job market and that academic staff as well are equipped to train learners at the cutting edge of their disciplines. I'm therefore very interested in learning how artificial intelligence is used or can be used to enhance the teaching and learning experiences of students and staff. Join me to welcome Dr. Giju Paul. Dr. Giju Paul, please introduce yourself to the participants. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Am I audible to you clearly? Yes, you are. Dr. Ali? Yeah, all right. So uh, it's a great opportunity because I'm at the age of 50. And when I started my education, I never seen a computer. But imagine, people think that education makes sense to life and your brains work. What we learn in the schools from kindergarten to your higher secondary, it's your graduation to post-graduation, 
gives you the basic knowledge of life and you're going to perform on that one. But when that's changed, Dr. Wolif's knowledge, Oscar's knowledge, and all the participants from 18 to 20 countries, your knowledge is dispersed the world around. And this knowledge is accumulated by artificial intelligence, and I can get a part of that knowledge to excel. This is the great point of artificial intelligence. Myself, Dr. Paul, a trained chef, a chef trainer, sent to an academician. So I've seen the practical aspects of life and the complex theories of learning, knowledge delivery, and practical applications of knowledge delivery. I can see my great professors from Itbati University, the professors from all over the world, and great business people, and you know, people in the different category of professional life are attending this seminar. I can understand the significance of this. So I'm introducing myself. I'm speaking from Kampala, Uganda, from the headquarters of Isbat University, Kampala. Uh, myself, master's in computer application, master's in business administration. I'm a student of MIT, Massachusetts, doing my artificial intelligence, data science, and machine learning. The encouragement is my students. I love my students. I love my peers. I love the people around the world who are educators, learners, business people, everyone. So thank you very much for the education collaborative to give me an opportunity because I'm from another continent, miles and miles away, but I get an opportunity to talk to you all. I thank God for first this opportunity and thank the organizers and thank for all attendees. Thank you, Dr. Oli. Thank you very much, Dr. Giju Paul from East Bat University. Uh, I'll now request Doc, Dr. Oscar Correa from Cavendish University, Zambia, to introduce himself to introduce himself to the audience. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Dr. Oli. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Oscar Correa and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor at Cavendish University, Zambia. Uh, in contrast to Dr. Paul, I come from industry. I have a, a background in IT. I've been, I have more than 25 years experience in technology and uh, I've worked in different sectors such as agriculture, IT services, telecommunications and mobile money, which is one of my passions. And uh, basically one of my, uh, let's say biggest projects I was involved in is deploying mobile money around 17 countries in Africa. So this has given me a good experience of the continent as well as uh, technology. And uh, I, I'm working currently at uh, Cavendish University, Zambia, where I'm the deputy vice chancellor but I'm also working for the parent company called Marifa Education, where I'm also the director of technology. And I, I, I'm very passionate about uh, technology and especially the role of technology in education. And, uh, and one of the, let us say the prime uh, activities right now in technology is the deployment of artificial intelligence. So, I'm very keen, I teach, I actually teach a course in artificial intelligence and I'm working to build systems that uh, apply artificial, artificial intelligence, both in education and in industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Oscar Correa. Members, uh, you've heard from the panelists. And again, I would like to remind you, please drop your names in the chat, your name, your institution and the country who, from which you're attending this webinar. AI and chat GPT considerations for higher education institutions in sub-Saharan Africa. What is chat GPT? What is artificial intelligence? What are we talking about? Why is it causing a star? What are its capabilities? Mr. Oscar Correa, please. Thank you, Dr. Olive. So allow me to share my screen. So I would like to just uh, start with a brief presentation on what AI is and ChatGPT. 
Uh, I'm a very visual person, so that's why I asked the panelists to allow me to do some slides. But I would like to start off with this picture and ask you if any of you might recognize the lady in the picture. And if you can put it in the chat. Does anyone recognize this lady? I don't see any comments in the chat. Nobody has seen this lady. All right. Thank you, Dr. Paul. So basically, this lady does not exist. This lady has been created by artificial intelligence. And if you go to the website, to the, to the link, and you click on this link, it will give you more people who don't exist. And this is an example of the generative uh, power of AI. It's called generative AI, which creates images based on images that it has collected in its database. And this helps us to get a bit of idea of what ChatGPT is. Because what ChatGPT does is it does the same thing that we're seeing for this image, but just doing it for text. So basically, what is ChatGPT? ChatGPT is a, a language uh, generation model. Okay, it was built first to work with language and developed by a company called OpenAI. Uh, OpenAI has been around for many years and has been working on AI, but this is one of the first products that has come out to, to the masses. And basically, internally, it uses something known as a transformer-based architecture, which is a, a technology that I will explain briefly. Using a lot of text, what it does is it reduces the text into a set of rules. And then it uses these rules to to perform various natural language processing tasks. And a few of them are listed there, but for those of you who have used already ChatGPT, uh, you may have already seen this, but for instance, you can type sentences and complete the sentence. You can ask it questions and it will respond to you. You can ask it to uh, translate and it will translate uh, sentences for you. And basically it allows us to build conversational AI applications in a way we have never seen before. Chatbots have existed for several years now, but the interaction with them has often been very, uh, very mechanistic. So if any of you have not tried it, I've put the link in the chat. And uh, I don't know if people could just put a message in the chat whether they've used ChatGPT or not. I guess it would also give us a sense of, uh, of the kind of audience we have out there. So basically just a quick primer on artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has been with us for over 70 years, but uh, as much as people had dreams about machines doing things you know, very quickly from the 50s and 60s, things have taken a, a bit longer than we thought. Yeah? And even then we're not at what we imagined like we see in the movies, like the Terminator, we're still very far from those kind of machines. So there's a lot of romanticism around artificial intelligence and what it can do and what it really does. But there have been three drivers that have made artificial intelligence more popular than ever before. And one of them has been you know, increasing computer power, which com continues to increase, actually. Also, there's been more data that's available, uh, first through the internet, through sensors, and all kinds of systems that we use and interact with. And lastly, the algorithms have also been improving. So people have been devising better and better algorithms. And so from the, the, the basic idea of artificial intelligence that we initially had, we began to start getting machines to learn. And eventually to this date, we have what we call deep learning. Uh, basically the industry has transformed itself as well from trying to put all the rules in the machine to realize that just giving data to the machine, the machine is able to make its own rules. And this is what deep learning is about, machines making their own rules. The problem with this is we don't understand all the rules. Uh, so basically <clears throat> the machines, the way we try to represent machines is to try to copy the brain. And we know that the brain is full of neurons and we, we started to make uh, electronic circuits and algorithms and data structures that copy these neurons. And over time, what has happened is we've realized we can get these neurons to work together. 
and the way we get them to get to work together is to link them up and make them work just like the brain works to come up with complex equations uh, that represent reality and if they don't represent reality we tell the machine it's made an error we tell the algorithm it's made an error and it fixes itself and so these models have been around for the last 20 years and they've been developing and developing and there are now so many models there's actually a website where they call it a zoo so one of some of those models actually handle uh, natural language processing some of these other models handle things like computer vision uh, also like uh, compression of data things like this but uh, basically if you look at chat gpt it's focused on language and just looking at the models that handle language basically what it does is it takes you know text breaks down the text tries to uh, tokenize it break it down into parts of speech try to uh, appreciate the links between the different part of the sentences and then to create its own sentences yeah so basically what it starts to do is to statistically predict the next word in a sentence so if you gave it a sentence it would then predict what the next word would be. And <clears throat> basically, just to give you an idea of uh, ChatGPT, they trained it on approximately 300 years of data, data based uh, on the time of the Gutenberg press, all that data that's available. And anything that was open source was used to train ChatGPT, at least ChatGPT version three. And all of this, uh, ChatGPT built lots of connections between the thousand trillions of words that it found so that it's statistically able to predict the next word. What's important to appreciate about ChatGPT is it's not the only one of its type. There are other models that are, that are there, that are out there, but we don't use them because we don't know about them and because they've not been made available to us. So one of the things that happens when you do these uh, language uh, models is you feed parameters into these kind of uh, models. And uh, basically what happens with ChatGPT, ChatGPT has uh, 175 billion parameters that are fed into it. So that's why it's called a large language model. It's really large. But what's interesting to know is it's not the largest. There are other larger models out there. Uh, and these are just uh, an exam some examples of different models out there that are being developed by different, uh, let's say, software companies. It's just that ChatGPT3 in November 22 was released with a very nice interface that made us, you know, interact with it quite seamlessly. So there are other models out there. And the message that I'm trying to, to get out here is that there are bigger things to come beyond chat gpt <clears throat> so basically going down specifically to how chat gpt works is chat gpt basically takes data and it's either labeled labeled with the help of a machine or with the help of a human being and then it's used to uh, build a model through a reward scheme where if it gets it right uh, it gets a reward and if it gets it wrong it gets a penalty and it goes through this uh, cycle endlessly until it gets an optimized model. It's not the perfect model, but it's an optimized model. So to be honest with you, there's a lot of mathematics that goes behind it and we don't have time to go through it here. And this is not the audience for that, but it basically uh, is intended to create very high accuracy text, not 100% accuracy, but high accuracy. And an example or a proof of how accurate it's been is when you start to put, give it tests. And you can see here that, uh, you know, if you look at the red bars, that's Jack GPT doing different exams, like the US SAT exam is scored more than the average. All right. And these are other models that have been used for other exams. And you can see many of these models are better than human beings. Now, very recently, about two weeks ago, or is it two weeks, maybe a bit more, OpenAI released a new version of ChatGPT, and that's called ChatGPT version 4. And this is a model they've been working on for the last six months, and they have been improving it. And here you can see uh, exams that they've been giving it and how much better it is than the previous one that they released in November. 
All right, and you can see maybe worryingly for us academics that it's doing quite well at the standardized exams. So what does it mean for us? Well, one of the things about uh, ChatGPT is that it's very intuitive. And this is both a, a positive thing and a negative thing, because that means it's very easy for us to use, but it also means it's very easy for our students to use and possibly uh, challenge some of the assessments that we, we traditionally put out there. Those take home assignments, you know, now they may be coming back to us done through ChatGPT. So <clears throat> one of the things about ChatGPT is it's more advanced than Google. It's it's more than just uh, looking for information that out there on the internet. What ChatGPT does is ChatGPT is able to search the information and then synthesize it for us in a way that you know we can read quickly. Yeah. You know? So for instance, I did tell you that I do work on, I mean, I do some technology work as well, and sometimes I have to write code. And sometimes the fastest way to write code is just to ask ChatGPT how to do it. I, before I would have to spend like maybe an hour Googling it, finding different articles and stuff, but you just ask ChatGPT and it just spins, spins it out. Yeah, but it can do that for many more things. Like for example, there's a, the, the key thing you need to know is how to prompt ChatGPT, how to ask it the questions. And here is an example. Okay, I don't have time to run it in a browser, but if, if there was, I would show it. But here's an example of a prompt where you know, you, you, you received an email from someone saying, dear Alan, or it could be dear Oscar, how should I learn more about AI? And then what you want to tell ChatGPT is, please write, please write for me a response. So you can just take this prompt over here and copy and paste it in ChatGPT and ChatGPT will write out the whole email for you. And then you take the email and you copy paste it into your mail and you send it to, to Jim, all right? So this is what we call a prompt. And the prompts could be, I mean, and this is this is what we call prompt engineering, finding the right prompt to get ChatGPT to do the right, the thing that you want it to do. So I put a link in the slides and I'm sure we're going to share this with, this, with the participants, uh, where there's something known as a ChatGPT prompt book, which gives you a list of different prompts you can actually submit to ChatGPT. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight as well is that <clears throat> being in Africa, we, we have challenges that are a bit different from the world. And uh, obviously, we, are, we know quite clearly that ChatGPT has a lot of dependence on the internet. But one of the challenges is that uh, we don't have a lot of access to internet in Africa. And so this is something that we need to consider for ourselves and for our students. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to message that I'm a bit over my time, so I'm going to uh, speed up. So basically what I just wanted to highlight is that there's a, there's a digital divide and this digital divide is, is big and it's getting worse. It'll get worse because of ChatGPT. And what we need to do is we really need to, to appreciate that ChatGPT may actually offer us the opportunity to leapfrog just the way we leapfrog with mobile telephony to catch up with the rest of the world. And then in terms of employability, uh, <clears throat> it's going to affect jobs, that's clear. But many employers think it's going to help us to work faster, although some think they're going to replace uh, people. In fact, a recent survey showed that the most people they're likely to replace are people in marketing. Then, it can also help people looking for jobs by helping them to put their CV in ChatGPT and create an application letter or even to make a cover letter. And my last slide is just to show you what are the different things that you can do with ChatGPT. And these are links, uh, there's a link at the bottom. If you can go to this site, you can see up to 20 different things the way you can actually use ChatGPT as part of your class. One of the most interesting ones is to remix it. So you ask students to write an essay and then put it back into ChatGPT and ask it to make a song or a rap out of it and see what the response is. So with that, I would like to finish and hand it back to Dr. Olive. Thank you.
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Okorea. We now know exactly what artificial intelligence is all about. If we're not yet very clear, don't worry, we'll have a time for questions. And we also know about chat GPT. One thing I've noticed, Oscar has told us that this is not the only language model. There are so many other language, large language models. There are so many other chatbots. And there's a lot more coming up. So I would like to ask Dr. Paul, how can educators design teaching, learning and research in a world where AI will be ubiquitous and its application uncertain? Tell yes. us, Paul, <laughs> Dr. Paul. All right. Uh, I, I hope you all can hear me. Still some people are trying to enter the room. Hope someone is admitting them. So I, I just seen, I was looking through the registration form. I found a lot of people. So I'm just going to answer uh, what Dr. Oliver asked. We, as a person, because our learning happens in many ways. No, it's, it's why we have knowledge. We need knowledge to make the skill. So some people may ask, hey, without skill, and skill, but things are a lot of confusing things. But I can tell you one thing, knowledge is mandatory, skill is mandatory. There is no point of having skill without knowledge, and there is no point of having skill without knowledge. This is my version of saying on this part. Now let's see how chat GPT can help on this one. Now, how our learning is happening. Because if you look at, look at our learning, it happens in our colleges, higher education institutions, because the scenario is more on higher education institutions. I focus more on higher education institutions. Our professors, teachers, we all have a syllabus, then the students do a self-study. There are two roles. In higher learning in institutions, the learning has two roles. One is the student, the learner. The other one is the person who is delivering the knowledge that is a professor. It's not like schools. So how fast the professor goes, the students, the learners has to work and run more and more. But the learning will be fast based upon the structure in which a professor, a teacher, or a knowledge delivering person is delivering the knowledge. The pace of learning happens with the structure in which the learning engagement is made to the learners. So I'm coming to my professors first, or my team leaders. If you want to teach people, if you want to make learn your people, your team members or your students, you should have a learning objective, learning outcome. So when you design your learning objectives and learning outcome, let it be any of your field. Either you're in business managing teams or you are a professor, as a teacher in higher education, chat GPT can help you a lot. It doesn't mean that chat GPT is not going to replace you because it's a language model. It cannot have that emotions like you. It cannot mentor a person. It cannot encourage somebody because individual is individual. So uh, to Dr. Olive's words, what I can say, first part, there is no confusion. Knowledge acquisition, knowledge, knowledge delivery cannot be replaced by chat GPT. But the good thing, somebody is delivering knowledge, he can use chat GPT to make quick delivery of knowledge. My professors are here. Dr. Gupta is here. Many of my professors are here. Dr. Ronald, my professors are here. And we are still, uh, I'm just telling them, use chat GPT to make uh, things better. I just remember a few days before I was talking to my, uh, one of my professors of finance, because I don't know, I'm very poor in finance management. My domain knowledge is not in finance. And I asked him to check whether chat GPT is doing better. He was telling me it is 99.99% accurate. Still, he's not able to find the inaccuracy in chat GPT. But I'll tell you one thing. My domain knowledge is in human resource management and computer science. And if I try to use chat GPT to teach something in finance management, it will be a total failure. This, this we need to be very cautious. 
So in as a knowledge, a person who is delivering knowledge, you have to ensure you don't be overconfident with the assistance of chat GPT. If you don't have that knowledge, then it is uh, very, very bad for the learner. Uh, Professor Oscar, Dr. Oscar, hope you can uh, hear me. Do you agree with that, what I said? Because yes. if, I, if I try to uh, teach the working of an AI mission, it will be hard, isn't it? Because you can teach it better. Can you, can you put your likes on that one? Yeah. So I think, I think if you look at the history of AI, for a long time, people were looking at it as machine against man. People were using it as a way to prove it against machines. So they would play chess. So can it beat a human being? at chess, can it beat a human being at go? But people have realized that actually the best combination is not machine against man. It's about both of them working together side by side. Just, just what you have said. The, the AI does some things better, okay? It does the tedious, the boring things more quickly, but the human being, you can't remove the human being. You can't remove the emotional intelligence. You can't remove that social context. You know, you can't remove that. Yeah, that's still part of our humanity, let's say. Yeah, so now I'm coming coming back. Thank you, Dr. Oscar. Now I'm coming back. Now you learn what a teacher can do with uh, chat GPT. Now me as a learner, because I'm also a learner. Everyone is a learner. Previously, when we were learning things, either you have to go to Google, you have to do internet. Now, nowadays I use another one called a u.com, you.com. It is an artificially intelligent website. But when I use with chat GPT, if I have any doubts, I keep one screen open for chat GPT. Anything, if I ask what is mean, what is standard deviation, it gives me very fast. Then I say, ask it. No, I don't understand. You give me a better example. Then it gives me an example. I say, no, I'm not still not understanding. Can you give me a very, very easy example? Man, it's, it's very interesting. So you as a student, and I tell all my teammates who are attending this, you are very good students because that's why you are good teachers. Any doubts you have, use chat GPT. It will give you accurate answers. Almost all, almost all. Now, today I was just uh, trying to ask something. What is a good treatment for diabetes? Can you just give me a prescription for diabetes? So it was telling me, no, I cannot prescribe. So I asked him, do you don't have knowledge on uh, pharmacogenesis and something about pharmaceuticals, then it was replying, I know, but I'm not supposed to do it. So what is your problem? If I am a doctor, medical doctor, are you not going to help me? Then chat GPT is telling, yes, I can help you. I can suggest you some medicines. Trusting that you are a doctor, but I don't say you are not supposed to use it. See, so the one implication, you are getting a knowledge, you are getting a skill, but don't be overconfident that with chat GPT, you'll get all the knowledge and you'll get all the skills. The domain thing is you, your knowledge, your skill. So, but chat GPT helps you to reduce the learning curve. There is ease of learning. There is ease of understanding skills. This is the best thing with the chat GPT to my knowledge. Now I, I want to add one thing because me, me, I'm a student as well. So I try to cheat, I try to cheat, uh, my exams using chat GPT. You know, I, I get very rigorous comments my, from, from, from my process as well. Because if you are a teacher, if somebody is using artificial intelligent techniques or structured language system to answer your question, yes, there are 10 to 15 plagiarism checking tools are available, especially for understanding language construction using artificial intelligence. So you as a professor or a teacher, don't worry because your students cannot cheat you if you know all these technologies. So what I want to sum up, knowledge is major part of a skill, but having knowledge alone does not make a sense because if you don't have a skill, what is the use of a knowledge? So what we have to do we have to mix both together. And we as educators, we as team leaders, we as leaders, we as the core people of any enterprise, either of our own or you're working with somebody, you have the role to establish and ensure that 
the people working with you have the right knowledge and the right skills. And I can say chat GPT can help you a lot in that. But me, a doctor named just because I'm a professor and I'm a PhD, but if I try to become a medical doctor using chat GPT, it's going to be horrible. This is, the, this is one thing we have to make sure, but it gives ease of life, make things very better to my knowledge up to now for learning, teaching, for anything. I was just looking, uh, Dr. Ali, if I'm crossing the time, just give me a hint. Yeah? I was just last 10 minutes, I checked now with chat GPT. Now I'm at Kampala. I have a team of 10 people selling used cars. What is the advice you're going to give me for the current market? Man, all my audience, you can't imagine, it's going to give me a lot of work what I have to do. But I'm not overexcited with ChatGPT, but it makes life easy. So as an educator, when we impart knowledge delivery, when we do skilling, we can use ChatGPT effectively. We can hold it together and make our people, our audience, our students, our team members to keep things going on. But make sure it should be under in a controlled way. It should be under surveillance. Because I've done a PhD which is having 750 pages with 750 citations. I can guarantee you chat GPT can do the review of literature and the full project in one hour. So what we have to understand, let's AI models don't conquer our capacity because it's a language model. But there's a good thing with that language model. It can give us different kinds of knowledge, dispersed knowledge. Because as I told you before, Dr. Oscar is having a knowledge. Uh, Dr. Olive is having a knowledge and all my attendees having a different, different domains of knowledge, maybe in particular subject. Chat GPT has a capacity to bring them all together and give to me. So to you all, if you use it effectively, it can do a better thing, knowledge and skilling. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Uh, Dr. Paul has assured us that chat GPT or any other artificial intelligence will not take the place of humans. It cannot compete with humans because there are things it cannot do. It cannot teach you a skill. Try learning how to drive on chat GPT. It cannot, it can give you the instructions, but the human being is still necessary to teach the skill. Okay, we are going to pause and have a poll. But before that, people have been asking in the chat, where is the link to chat GPT? And Dr. Korea has put the link, so please check the link and try it. If you have any question, please feel free to pop your question in the chat box. We'll get it from there. Now, we've thought about chat GPT. We've heard of the different things it can do in the lecture room in education. We are going to run a poll. Please pop your response in the poll. Okay, I think we can um, end the poll now. Yes, yes, we can, we can, uh, we can see the poll. Yes, uh, please. Dr. Oscar, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we we are seeing the poll because when Thank we look into much. the poll, uh, what we what we can see okay. 20, 22 percent it says that there is a lack of knowledge on AI tools and platforms. Uh, uh, that is that is the major one. Like then 25 percent it says that insufficient technical expertise in AI. So these are the two things catch to me. Uh, over to you, Dr. Olive and Dr. So, so I think the thing that stands out from the poll is that uh, uh, people feel there is insufficient technical expertise in AI. So I think uh, maybe if I could quickly comment, I think that the two main items was insufficient technical expertise on AI. And the next one was the lack of knowledge of AI tools and platforms. So maybe doc, Dr. Paul, would you like to comment on this? Yes, uh, I, I, I will comment on not like a tech, technical expert like Dr. Oscar. I, I talk on behalf of a common man because that will be the best perspective. I tell you, if you want to use an AI platform, you don't need any knowledge. You don't need a knowledge. 
The only thing you have to know what you want to extract. Because I see some comments that the references given by the chat GPT are not proper, not correct. Because we have to understand one thing. When we work with chat GPT, don't quickly ask it a question. Because since it is a language model, but uh, you try to start with simple questions and try to make sure that language model, it is working what you are requiring. Like if you quickly ask a question, sometimes it makes, it, there are a chances that it can make a mistake. So the environment in which you chat, it should understand what are you focusing either on data science or human resource management, on human motivation, human skills. So what I, what I tell, to my knowledge, I don't need a specific AI skill to work with chat GPT to extract knowledge. But what I say, I should know what really I want to extract. That is the basic solution I want to tell for that question, uh, Dr. Oscar. Uh, maybe one of the things we probably underestimate about AI is that we are actually already using AI in our lives. We don't, uh, we don't even uh, realize we use it so seamlessly. Every time maybe you book an Uber, Uber or when you go on to Google Maps, uh, you're using AI. So, so actually, you may be surprised how much you already know about AI. Yeah, but in terms of uh, insufficient technical expertise, I think uh, I, I do appreciate that concern, but I think what needs to be done is to make people aware of the resources out there because there are a lot of free resources that can help people you know, learn about AI. And then the other problem with AI is it's such a broad topic. Yeah, what exactly is AI? You know, is it is it the mathematics? Is it the computer science? Is it the domain? And actually, the truth of it is a combination of all these three things. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> it's something that that uh, you know you need to look at your own field. So I think someone even mentioned in the chat that there's one maybe option missing about how we can implement it in education. But we need to look at our own domain and then think how we can use AI in that domain. Thank I you. Thank you yeah. very much, uh, Oscar. I'm sorry my internet has been uh, a bit unstable, but I'm back. And thank you very much, Oscar, for your contribution and for Dr. Paul. Um, I can see a number of questions in the chat. One of them, one question a person is asking, let me see, who is it? Um, Chris Fowler is saying that the biggest challenge in his mind is integrating artificial intelligence in pedagogy or creating a new pedagogy. What do you have to stand coupled with another comment from a, a participant wondering that artificial intelligence or chat GPT is going to reduce the critical thinking of students. Is this true? And of course, people are not mentioning it, but I'm sure at the back of their minds, they're also asking about academic Can you give us an answer for this? I think that's a key question. And that's why many of us are here today to see how we can use it to improve pedagogy. So one of the things is that, you know, education is said to be one of those things that changes very slowly. If you look at the models of cars and you look at the models of computers, they change every year, but education is something that seems to change very slowly. And even to that extent, you know, how well has it, you know, adapted to the modern ways of working? So I think, uh, to be honest with you, there's been need to kind of revolutionize education to change it, to make it uh, more customized to the students and that's where AI starts to take a you know to take a role where it can create like individualized learning paths for students yeah so I actually know a gentleman in Australia who's developing a, a tool that you know can monitor the the way students answer assessments and then give them customized assessments yeah so so there are more and more tools coming out like this and, and there's need to like actually manage all the information that's out there so that we can take advantage of it. But uh, it's definitely coming out there. And if you look at some of the links that I've shared, particularly the link in the last one, it gives you an idea of how you can actually 
you know, turn things around with ChatGPT. Yes, there's a danger that it will, you know, uh, deaden our sense of critical thinking. Yeah, but there's also an opportunity for us to turn it around and make us think even deeper than the shallow critical thinking we may already be doing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Oscar. And that is also related to another comment in the chat. How do you ensure academic integrity and ethical practices in using chat GPT? Could we, could higher education institutions, for example, shift to problem-based assessment? Could they shift to skill-based work? Is asking in the chat, can we have an answer to this? Could it be that it is a move to skill-based assessment that we want? Because, you know, teaching is changing, but so is assessment. Assessment is also changing. What can higher education institutions do? Can chat GPT defeat educators if we move to problem solved assessment, problem solving assessments and move away from rote learning? Dr. Paul. Great, because uh, that, that question is a bit tricky question because uh, we see we have to see it in the two perspectives. Whether uh, Chat GPT is going to kill away the educators? Is that going to kill the educators? No. I'll tell you, it, it depends upon the teacher or the curriculum what you are going to deliver to the student and what is going to be the outcome of the learning. So the basic factor or the basic pillar of any curriculum or any learning is how the course is designed. If it is a outcome-based course design, definitely it is going to deliver the knowledge and there will be a skill outcome. ChatGPT, what it can do, it can help to make this process ease, the ease of doing these things, setting objectives, making the curriculum, preparing notes, it can help in that way. But if you, are, if you are giving an assignment to a student and you can sometimes you see that, oh, the student don't have so much capacities, but is performing very well. With that intuition, if you look into that one and check for the language constant use, it may be an intelligent tool the student might have used. So what I want to tell you, a teacher is a teacher and a student is a student. And chat GPT or any AI models are an interface, an interlacing component that helps us to make the learning process in a better and easy way. It cannot keep a learner away. It cannot keep a teacher away because teaching is not only giving information. It is identifying emotions of the student, getting into the heart of a student because there is a saying, one child, one book, one pen, and a teacher can change the world around. Which means that if there is a teacher, if there is a learner, and if there is a tool that can change the world of that child, of that learner, the, the, child, the world of a learner is changed, that will change the world of a household, it will change the world of a society, it will change the world of a nation and the entire globe. So we cannot change it like in the following way, one child or one learner, one chat GPT or an AI tool can make the world change the world around. No way. It cannot change the world around. Because me, me, I'm from India, and we always say father, mother, God, and the teacher are equals. Which means that for a learner, my teacher is like my father, my mother, and my God or goddess, whatsoever. So we cannot replace that with. Chat GPT or any AI tool. This is what I want to tell you that we higher education stakeholders, we have to understand what all technologies come in this world. Your role is inevitable. You have to maintain your responsibility. You cannot say that, okay, I just say something, let my students use Chat GPT. I, I, I think, very yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights. There are a few 
comments in the chat box. Okay, oh, we'll back through. up. The hand is back up. Sorry. Can we say, please go on? And I'm coming yeah. to the comments in the chat in a bit. Doctor, can we? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you so much uh, about this. I think this one is just a game changer and also a boost uh, to the teaching. Uh, to me, I see that it is an advantage because it is encouraging, according to Brom Taxonomy. It's encouraging the high order uh, thinking because uh, from teaching profession, uh, what we are aiming at teaching the learner or the learner to learn, we aim at, oh, at uh, psychomotor, uh, cognitive, okay, and then affective, not so the feel, having the feel, and then this student must act, and then this student also must have critical thinking. So the chat GTP is just bring, bridging a gap. It, it is not taking it all, but it is a tool that is helping us, like somebody using a blackboard. A blackboard will help, will help me to to cut out my role to, uh, to, I'm not interested in the blackboard, but the blackboard will help me to write on it and transmit information to the student. So we are seeing also that uh, this AI, which is the GTP is coming in to help us, especially uh, uh, sometimes we are been using the lower order knowledge only. Okay, uh, because now one of the days you could ask students to state, just define oh, outline. That. But when, if you have the GTP, because it's going to challenge you, it is going to give the answer. So what does it mean? It means we have to move the, the high order design because if I put it maybe in chat, chat GTP, uh, there are certain things that it may not give to my students. So it is going to make also my the, the lecture to think, okay? To think, I think uh, setting application questions, okay? Giving them scenarios. I think somebody was talking about it. But now here we shall be talking about applying the knowledge. So chat GTP is very, very important in the teaching. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kimwise. He mentioned. Yes, I'm, I'm from Cavendish University, Uganda. <laughs> Sorry. Now, I'll go through some of the comments in the chat, uh, and our panelists can prepare to respond. Okay, I'll begin here. How can chat GPT technology be used to support research and innovation in the field of education? Is AI protected by the Copyright Act? No, it is not. It is not. And those are some of the challenges that, that are threatened to be raised in a... I see um, there's a hand up from Kobina Yabua. Kobina, please go ahead while I look through the chats for more comments. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, it's a very insightful conversation and I'm glad to be part. So straight to my contribution. Um, I think that anyone who is of the view that chat GPT or AI in general is going to impede critical thinking uh, is quite mistaken because um, the, the, the system doesn't even generate the prompts on their own. You need to be a critical thinker to be able to get the right prompt from chat GPT. So if people make the argument on the back, I mean, people make the case on the back of the argument that uh, chat GPT is going to make us lazy, should, should also quit using calculators, should quit yeah. using mobile phones, should quit yeah. using anything technology that makes life easier. In fact, what's the essence of critical thinking? I mean, critical thinking, once, I mean, computers or AI is able to give us that critical, uh, critically thought through prompt, there is no need to, uh, I mean, uh, putting pressure on the brains to be able to, you know, think critically. So when uh, a system like AI, open AI is doing everything for us. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's a very good thing that we have AI in the system and it is helping us. Maybe it is now time for us to allow uh, things of the lower mind to be done by AI. And then we focus on being able to use our higher minds. I'm trying to go philosophical and spiritual. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you now, very much, Kabana. Thank Bruce, you. I, I want to answer one critical question. 
This okay. is by uh, Mugge Gideon. Uh, the question is, oh, sorry, it is Mugge Gideon, I believe. The question is, what you are concerned regarding chat GPT in online learning, especially in universities that offer online exams? Okay, I'm coming to that point because I'll tell you, first thing, let me take as a student, because when I do an online exam, I can put the question to chat GPT, definitely it'll give me hundred percentage perfect answer. Even problem also, it gives me hundred percentage perfect answer. But what you can do, there is a facility called as lockdown browser. A lockdown browser is when you are giving your exams to a student, you have to ask the student to only use the lockdown browser. You can use your links to be done through the lockdown browser only. So if the student is attempting to use any of the other browsers or open, try to open a new window or a new tab or a different application, it will close the exam. So there is a facility for that one. So in which uh, the student cannot use chat GPT or other means. And more on top of that one, we at Isbat University, we use another proctoring using artificial intelligence because we look at the movements of the student. Suppose the student is trying to look into a piece of paper and trying to put the things automatically, the, the camera that is attached to the student's system will make the look the exam. So that is a motion detection using artificial intelligence. So that these two methods uh, can help. Uh, the first one, what I told is a lockdown browser. The usage of that one can stop students know to use these kind of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Paul. Uh, Oscar, did you want to add to it? Uh, yeah, I wanted to answer another question that's been coming up in the chat okay. regarding the ethics. Yeah. yeah. So the, the ethics of artificial intelligence is quite, uh, quite a challenge. Mm. Yeah. If you look at uh, what we look at data ethics, you know, the management of data, many countries have uh, data protection acts. And these data protection acts are very clear about uh, what to do with data, who is a data controller, who is a data processor, what to happen, what happens if data is leaked, you know, what are the steps, what are the even standards. With AI, it's a different ball game because, you know, if, if you look at a, an example of a weapon, you know, if someone has a gun and, and, and someone kills somebody with a gun, who is at fault? Obviously, the person who fired the gun, yeah. But you can't blame the manufacturer or the distributor. You could say, yeah, they do have some role, but ultimately it's the one who fired the gun. With AI, we have a different problem because actually the AI thinks for itself or seems to think for itself, you know? So even someone using AI to come up with, a, you know, using ChatGPT to come up with an answer, they may very innocently think that's a very valid answer, but owing to biases, owing to the, the way it's been implemented, it it may be it may be wrong it may be criminal you know so there's actually a whole chain that needs to be understood and actually okay this is a huge debate it's very difficult to actually put a law out there for ai and uh, the best that people have come up with and some of the best regulations are in the eu people have put out guidelines that everyone from the developer from the implementer the one who's testing the one who's even using it have some responsibility and, and one of the important things that needs to be taught in our education system is that when you're developing AI systems, they need to be developed inclusively. You need to get everyone around the table. You need diversity when you're building these systems. Yeah, so it's a big topic, but it's a very important topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much uh, for that addition. And I think it's it really goes to uh, some of, I think some of the, the foundational the aspects yeah. Uh, Rose, I, I, seen a question. I seen a question by Jenna. Um, no. Yeah, one, one moment, Dr. Paul. I wanted to add um, just a, uh, uh, quickly, bringing us back to one of the uh, um, areas that we were looking at from the very beginning, or we are considering from the very beginning, is how higher education institutions need to really think around, um, I think, to, to Oscar's point and to Kovner's point around policies or structures like what how is it going to be governed in your institution you know what control what is the the how 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 is it to be used in your institution what are the policies of your institution regarding this 
Um, Sh Shamim Nasa has a comment, a comment in here that something that seems to come up a lot is the need for students or any other chat GPT user to make their own ethical decisions not to misuse it. This points to a need for higher education institutions to invest more efforts into revising how we approach ethics in education and research to make sure that more students and researchers are able to embody what is taught and not just to look at ethics as a theoretical concept. So I think to a certain point, it's, you know, it's like uh, what Oscar, you were just saying, there is the tool, um, there's what it can be used for, there's the fact that it keeps improving every day. And I think there were some comments in the chat that even uh, chat GPT itself and AI uh, um, developers are even developing ways to check plagiarism, et cetera. Um, but then there's also the other side of it that institutions need to begin developing um, you know, other ways to, you know, for students and researchers to really, you know, uh, uh, manage their own ethics, right? Uh, um, to act in an ethical fashion, and how to use these tools um, for research and for teaching and learning. Um, let's see, is there, are there any other hands up uh, from the participants? Any other comments um, or contribution anyone wants to make? Yes, um, Claude, kindly go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Claude um, uh, from Kepler College in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, I, I have a question. So uh, what can you advise higher education institutions uh, in terms of um, helping students uh, continue keeping uh, up with academic honesty and integrity? Because it's, it's really difficult uh, to trace if a student is using chat GPT or other artificial intelligence um, in their work and their assignment. So how do you go um, to advise higher education institutions to help students, to hold students accountable in terms of um, helping them to um, abide by academic honesty and integrity? Mm, thank you, Claude. Um, can we get Daniel's comment or question as well? And then we can address both of them. Daniel, sure. Can yeah, this is Daniel. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. So I work in the computer science department for Asanska University at OEB. And my background has been in software development for the last 40 years. So I've lived in the world of computers ever since they came around. And my observation when ChatGPT came was, this is great, this is awesome. So I challenged ChatGPT to do some of my work for me. And I'll say in most cases, 90%, ChatGPT has turned out to be the most incredible assistant I've ever had. When I need code that is deep, that requires a little bit more than just your normal person to interpret what I need, I go to ChatGPT and I'll ask him, or I'll ask her, Chat GPT, can you help me with this? First response, no, I can't help you. Then I'll say, Chat GPT, what do you know about end accept? He goes, oh, I know end accept. I said, okay, here's the output of a web service. Show me the end accept syntax. And it generates it for me. It practically rewrote Java unit test cases for me. And it's gotten me excited. I'm actually going to be writing a book on it. How do you write Java test cases? And I have over 150 examples just from my interaction with ChatGPT. I'm writing code eight times faster than I did when I was younger. And I'm 62 years old. So you can just imagine how excited I am about ChatGPT. I'm copying whole Excel spreadsheets, pasting it into ChatGPT and says, summarize it for me, do some analysis for me, and it always never fails. So I'm just volunteering my service. Anybody's confused about ChatGPT, they should reach out to me and I have time and I love to teach. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. I think it goes to, I think uh, one of the stuff point, um, Dr. Paul and Oscar mentioned earlier about knowledge and skill, right? Um, knowing exactly how to use the tool um, and how to just how to give it a combination of things to you know help you arrive at what you're looking for. Um, I don't know if there's other hands up um, questions, comments in the 
in the audience before, I don't know, Dr. Olive, are you back now? Yes, I am. Oh, perfect. Um, I don't know if you have more questions for the audience or the panelists. Uh, Rose, Rose, with your permission, because there was a question asked by Claude from Kepler, Kepler College, Rwanda, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Kigali. Uh, this yes. is oh, yeah, no, the first question. On I'm academic apologies. integrity, yeah. Yes, academic, academic integrity. Yes, honesty. Now, mm -hmm. I, I want to add on that one because in my university, I am also a part of the assessment and evaluation. I also look after the assessment and evaluation. Because I, I, our professors, because basically you as a teacher, you know that integrity and honesty, if you, are in, if, you, if you have integrity and if you have honesty, definitely that will be imparted to your students. But you know, the world is so smart because everyone uses smart methods and shortcuts. So what do you have to do? One, you have to promote ethics in your classroom. But this will alone will not work because uh, there is no ideal world. Otherwise, we don't need any courts, any court of law, or any policing, or any jails. We don't want any bus. But one thing, you promote ethics. The other side, you should have monetary methods. You should have mechanism to monitor. I think some people, I heard that somebody stopped uh, chat GPT usage in the institution itself. They blocked that website. I said, it's no, you cannot use that. But what do you have to do? See, me, if I have a student, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 students with me, I should have some capacity to assess my students. What is the capacity of my student? And if I see my student is over sprouting with a lot of jargons, complex technical words, than beyond his capacity, yes, I should do a technical assessment. Where are these boys getting this one? Yes, then you can find there is a language construct that is happening in between using artificial intelligent methods. And if you want to still check, you can use a plagiarism software. That is one method. So basically as a teacher, you should have the capacity to assess your learners, not only with their answers, but also how capacities they are in. And if they quickly change that, if they boost up like anything in split second, yes, they're using chat GPT then or artificial intelligence tools. The second one, if a student using that kind of things, yes, you put punishments. So what is going to happen? The students will ensure that I don't do this malpractice. I call it as a malpractice because it is a cheating. It's a cheating. As I told you before, something what I've done for five years can be done in one hour or one day. So these two things we, uh, we educated has to make sure the integrity as well as the academic honesty. Promote that one, then make measures to look into that one. These are the only two things I can suggest. Uh, thank you, uh, Cloud, for that question. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And of course, just remind our attendees and people who are interested in this question on academic integrity, the answer really lies in the shift from rote, rote memory, knowledge-based learning, and the shift, so we need to shift to skill-based learning. We need to shift to problem-based learning. And of course, when we shift to problem-based learning, we are also meeting the needs of industry. And so, of course, we are giving our learners the objectives that we set out to, to achieve. But then what about also giving our learners assignments to use chat GPT? You ask them to actually use chat GPT and then to give you references, to support the answer, to critique the assessment on chat GPT, because we've already seen chat GPT does not give us references. Sometimes it makes them up, it hallucinates. So you can actually use the policies. Uh, there was a discussion on here about policies in our higher education institutions, policies in individual lecture rooms, where you may tell your students whether or not to use chat GPT and when they use it, they should be able to critique it. And so we should not be very focused on deterrence. We should be and detection. We should instead opt for those higher skills. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to invite um, Dr. Korea to make uh, some, your closing remarks. Give us what would you say are your closing remarks, Dr. Oscar, in a minute. Okay, thank you, Dr. Olive. So one thing I would like to, to say is that, you know, often we are asking ourselves, uh, you know, what can 
what can technology do for education? Yeah, and actually I would like to quote a professor from uh, Illinois, University of Illinois, who said, actually we should be asking it the other way. What can education do for technology? Uh, you may not be aware, but actually the first computers that were built, some of the biggest ones were in, in, in the University of Illinois. And the first problem they had is that they couldn't enter data in the, into the system. So they had to develop a keyboard. That's where a keyboard was invented. And then students couldn't see things on an on, on a interface. So they needed to develop a screen. So one of the things we need to ask ourselves is, okay, there's chat GPT, there's AI, and there's more stuff coming. But let's ask what, what do our students really need? What do we really need? To improve learning and let's ask this from the technology yeah so my challenge is think of it the other way around thank you dr Ones. thank you very much uh dr korea we need to think about what uh technology can do for our students what our students need from the technology what do they need from the technology and once that is addressed then we can use technology profitably Dr. Paul, what would you say are your yeah. final words? Yeah, uh, I hope uh, everyone can hear us. So thank you very much all attendees first, because it's a big audience. So what I'm saying, I, I'm going to say five, five things, maybe 20, 20 seconds. Maybe I may cross more than a minute. Sorry, Dr. Oliver and Oscar. First thing, chat GPT, good or bad? It is like sugar. Sugar is good. But if you use it more, it is going to kill you. So what, do you, what I want to tell you, use it wisely. Use it as per your need. Don't fully eat it. That is first thing. So the goodness depends upon how you consume it. Consume it. The second thing, use this AI tool, chat GPT, as an opportunity. Never think it is going to kill you or not going to kill your students. Because critical thinking, it is individual's IQ quotient. Chat GPT cannot kill it because it cannot replace a learner or a teacher. The third thing, never ever make it as a substitute. You as a teacher, you as a team leader, you should lead the team, you should teach, not chat GPT. Then the next point, what we have to use, it can reduce the search time of data. That is the best thing in chat GPT. Because if you want to search some topic, you have to go to 100 websites to get Make all the things together, then you have to present. But chat GPT is a collection of things, so you have to use it. So this is the good message or concluding remarks I want to tell you all. Use it wisely, but it is not going to kill you or don't kill yourself using chat GPT. What is going to happen? Ultimately, you will be thrown Please. out of your profession. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Uh, so now we are coming to a close. I would like to, uh, just as we're coming to a close, I would like to assure all our participants that we have achieved the aim of this uh, webinar because we know what AI and ChatGPT are all about. We know how to incorporate it in our teaching and learning and research. And we know that we should not avoid it as a threat to learning, but rather we should leverage it as something to help us in our teaching, learning, and assessment. We are assured that artificial intelligence will not replace human beings, rather that the two can work together in a complementary manner. We need to learn new skills to help us to deal with chat GPT, prompt engineering. We need to set up policies in our institutions. The conversation is not ended today. The conversation is ongoing. We continue to reflect. We continue to think. So keep going. Do not resist technology. You have to leverage it as it is uh, a supplement. Let's tell our students about chat GPT. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to say, uh, please do not go. We are going to have a group photograph. We are also going to do an evaluation. I would like to thank you so very much. We've received all the questions and comments in the chat. And so we shall be responding to these. Uh, if we've not responded to them now, we shall be sharing on your emails where you have shared your email. And thank you very much. And I would like now to hand over to the organizers.
Thank you so much, uh, um, Dr. Olive, um, Dr. Paul and Oscar. Very, very, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you to all the audience for joining. As Dr. Olive said, this is not the end. This is only the beginning. Obviously, there's more we need to discuss around actually how do we implement some of the stuff that we've discussed here today, right? So how do we implement uh, uh, um, embracing chat GPT in the classroom for research, for learning? Um, a lot of this conversation will continue dur during the track on faculty development at the upcoming June convening, which is in June, also organized by the Education Collaborative at Shesi University. So if you, are, if you are able to, please join us this June in Accra from the 14th, from the uh, uh, 14th to the 17th or 13th to the 17th in Accra. Um, for now, let's see, I think we're gonna do a photo, right? Yes, hi everybody. My name is Charlene. I work with the Education Collaborative. I'll just ask for us all to switch on our cameras. We're just going to take a group picture. I'll be taking three pictures and I'll be counting us down from three to one. And then we take the snapshots. So I hope everybody's camera is on. We are all smiling, happy, having had a great session. And we're just going to go through the motions of taking a picture. So we're taking our first picture. Three, two, one, cheese. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm putting the evaluations in the chat box. Um, please fill it before you leave the session. Um, we've all learned a lot. So please don't leave, fill it before you leave. Thank you very much. And then the registration for the June convening is also in the chat box. Um, um, early bird registration ends April 17. Um, you don't want to miss that. So you can also register as well. So the June convening is bringing together institutional executives, um, heads of department from across the continent, um, policy experts, to come share learnings um, and also continue the discussions that we've started. And we'll do all of this in person. So please register for the June convening. Also, you have the opportunity to apply for grants um, of up to $200. So the grants are also ending on April 17th. So it's very important that we apply very early so that we have um, access to apply for the grants as well. So take this opportunity um, in the, on the call to apply for the June convening as soon as you can and also for the grants. Thank you so much. Thank you.